Hi there. You've got Rock Will Read. Today I'm going to be reading an article um, from Time, as you can see in the title already. It's called How the U.S. Got Its Police Force. It's an article by Olivia B. Waxman, and it was published May 18th, 2017. <clears throat> it would be easy to think that the police officer is a figure who has existed since the beginning of civilization. That's the idea on display in the proclamation from President John F. Kennedy on the dedication of the week of May 15th as National Police Week, in which he noted, that law enforcement officers had been protecting Americans since the nation's birth. In fact, the U.S. police force is a relatively modern invention, sparked by changing notions of public order, driven in turn by economics and politics, according to Gary Potter, a crime historian at Eastern Kentucky University. Policing in colonial America had been very informal, based on a for-profit, privately funded system that employed people part-time. Towns also commonly relied on a night watch in which volunteers signed up for a certain day and time, mostly to look out for fellow colonists engaging in prostitution or gambling. Boston started one in 1636, New York followed in 1658, and Philadelphia created one in 1700. But that system wasn't very efficient because the watchmen often slept and drank while on duty. And there were people who were on watch as a form of punishment. Night watch officers were supervised by constables, but that wasn't exactly a highly sought after job either. Early policemen didn't want to wear badges because these guys had bad reputations to begin with. And they didn't want to be identified as people that other people didn't like, says Potter. When localities tried compulsory service, if you were rich enough, you paid someone to do it for you. Ironically, a criminal or a community thug. As the nation grew, however, different regions made use of different policing policies. In cities, increasing urbanization rendered the night watch system completely useless as communities got too big. The first publicly funded, organized police force with officers on duty full-time was created in Boston in 1838. Boston was a large shipping commercial center, and businesses had been hiring people to protect their property and safeguard the transports of goods from the Boston port to other places, says Potter. These merchants came up with a way to save money by transferring to the cost of maintaining a police force to citizens by arguing that it was for the collective good. In the South, however, the economy Economics that drove the creation of police forces were centered not on the protection of shipping interests, but on the preservation of the slavery system. Some of the primary policing institutions, there were the slave patrols tasked with chasing down runaways and preventing slave revolts. Potter says, the first formal slave patrol had been created in the Carolina counties in 1704. So if we go back a little bit, just going to pause. Remember, Boston started in 1636, New York in 1658, Philadelphia in 1700. And now we go down to the southern cities and states, and now we have Carolina and their colonies created uh, their first formal slave patrol, which, which was different from what the other northern states policing was. So back to the reading. 
During the Civil War, the military became the primary form of law enforcement in the South. But during Reconstruction, many local sheriffs functioned in a way analogous to the earliest slave patrols, enforcing segregation and the disenfranchisement of freed slaves. In general, throughout the 19th century and beyond, the definition of public order, that which the police officer was charged with maintaining, depended whom was asked. For example, businessmen in the late 19th century had both connections to politicians and an image of the kinds of people most likely to go on strike and disrupt their workforce. So it's no coincidence that by the late 1880s, all major U.S. cities had police forces. Fears of labor union organizers and of large waves of Catholic, Irish, Italian, German, and Eastern European immigrants who looked and acted differently from the people who had dominated the cities before drove the call for the preservation of law and order or at least a version of it promoted by the dominant interest. For example, people who drank at taverns rather than at home were seen as dangerous by others, but they may have pointed out other factors, such as how living in a smaller home makes drinking in a tavern more appealing. The irony of this logic, Powder points out, is that the businessmen who maintained this belief were the ones who profited off the commercial sale of alcohol in public places. At the same time, the late 19th century was the era of the political machine, so police captains and sergeants for each precinct were often picked by the local party political party ward leader who often owned taverns or ran street gangs that intimidated voters. Then they were able to use the police to harass opponents of that political party or provide payoffs for officers to turn a blind eye to allow illegal drinking, gambling, and prostitution. The situation was exasperated during Prohibition leading President Hoover to appoint the Wickersham Commission in 1929 to investigate the ineffectiveness of law enforcement nationwide. To make police independent from political party ward leaders, the map of police precincts was changed so that they would not correspond with political wards. The drive to professionalize the police followed, which means that the concept of a career cop as we'd recognize it today is less than a century old. Further campaigns for police professionalism were promoted as the 20th century progressed, but crime historian Samuel Walker's The Police in America, an introduction, argues that the move toward professionalism wasn't all good. That movement, he argues, promoted the creation of police departments that were inward-looking and isolated from the public and crime control tactics that ended up exasperating tensions between police and the communities they watch over. And so, more than half a century after Kennedy's 1963 proclamation, the improvement and modernization of America's surprisingly young police force continues to this day. Thank you for listening. I hope as I continue to read, I continue to improve. And I hope that me reading so that you don't have to helps you learn more and more each day.